so so this is um as you are aware it's an open session um and um you know the idea is for you to be able to raise questions uh, anything that you wanted clarification on um and i can try my best to see if i can you know explain some of the stuff that sarthak has a query how is philopodium different from a lamellipodium um a philopodium is this kind of very pointed membrane extension right it's almost like a finger that is jutting out um that um, the cell uses to probe its environment the purpose of the philopodium and lamellipodium is very different the lamellipodium is actually kind of a front it's like a wave of membrane right so this is when the cell keeps doing this uh, in the front of the cell um this membrane that is being held up by the actin cytoskeleton underneath and is being pushed uh, right um, that entire membrane is called the lamellipodium this pointed projection is however called the philopodium and the philopodium um, has a different architecture because of the way actin bundles are put together to create that protrusion philopodium can be withdrawn can be put out withdrawn uh, lamellipodium can also be put out withdrawn the lamellipodium actually has um, a very distinct wavy pattern you know where uh, there are certain parts of the lamellipodium that are pushed forward some are withdrawn they both can happen at um, in a migrating cell and um, the philopodium tends to happen early on when the cell is trying to probe its environment so the way they are assembled um the architecture of these structures are all different uh, the purpose they serve is also different sarta okay we'll have queries uh, sneha sneha you have a query go ahead uh, so yesterday i was reading the notes um, so sir i was uh, i didn't got uh, one of the point mm -hmm. it was like golgi pinches of transport vesicles and other vesicles that gives rise to lysosomes and vacuoles mm -hmm. so see vesicular structures the golgi you remember we saw a movie of um, a membrane from the golgi budding out uh, which is mediated by this um, clathrin that sits on this Uh, membrane it pulls it out pinches it um, and then the clathrin disassembles and now a vesicle floats away right so there are a couple of different ways by which vesicles can be pinched off from the golgi um, a lot of these vesicles make up that come out from the golgi are the ones that um, you know depending upon the composition that they carry um, can become different vesicular components including lysosomes Uh, right and so um, even vacuoles are formed largely from the coming together of uh, vesicles uh, to create bigger uh, you know vacuole like structures uh, which they then eventually become vacuoles right so um, so a lot of the origin of these structures is from the fact that from the golgi they can bud off that's what that uh, you know, that statement is meant to say right rk uh, rishab kulkarni rishab you have a query about uh, clathrin uh, in endocytosis see I, i i haven't covered endocytosis and there is an intent here in not covering endocytosis because it uh, if you cover one you will have to cover a lot of other things and you know we are also doing things uh, in a form that um, you know everybody gets most of what is done in class um and it's all not too overwhelming so clathrin mediated endocytosis is not part of what we are covering here but in the interest of the query um, uh, what i will tell you is clathrin is a very distinct um kind of protein it's a triskelion it has three um kind of uh, uh structures if you want to call it three uh, the protein has three arms to it if you want to call it that and and these uh, structures fit into each other and they create um you know what looks like a a football right um, um a structure that looks like uh, the skeleton of a football um and um that triskelion um, attaches obviously to the membrane um and plays a vital role in bending the membrane in such a way that now the membrane also acquires the shape of the football right um and then of course there is a mechanism by which the final pinching of the membrane can take place and once pinching happens then the triskelium again this is regulated you know by uh, phosphorylation and other changes uh, to this protein it can disassemble so it will assemble form this structure allow the membrane to acquire this 
shape of the structure once the membrane pinches off uh, you know this structure disassembles and now you have a floating membrane vesicle that has effectively been pinched off um, and and that's um, one of the mechanisms of endocytosis um, you know which is clathrin mediated endocytosis there are obviously other mechanisms of endocytosis like um, caviolar endocytosis um, you know there is a there is a click geek pathway right um, and i won't get into what each of these means but there are many methods by which endocytosis can happen not everything has an elaborate triskelium like mechanism uh, in that sense clathrin is very unique uh, you know uh, as far as endocytosis is concerned anand has a query uh, does the viral dna in case of infection enter the nucleus via the npc can the npc stop this viral dna from entering sometimes i actually don't know i actually don't know whether uh, that's the only way for entry or whether there are other ways for entries uh, you know, if you find out, let me know as well. Um, I I'm not aware if all viral DNA enters only exclusively through the NPC. Um, Abhishek has another query: How is motor protein traffic maintained without collisions happening between them, or are there separate microtubules for antigrade? No. So so the clear no here is that there isn't a microtubule that carries motor proteins in only in one direction and one that carries in the other direction. Okay, that doesn't happen. Um, it is very clear that there is movement happening in both directions on a microtubule strand. And there is um, uh, documented evidence for this as well. So it's unlikely that, uh, you know, there is a selected microtubule going in this direction and one in the other direction. Now, how do they avoid collisions? Um, it isn't entirely clear whether um, collisions are actually avoided, uh, right? So it's highly possible that uh, collisions are part of what the motor protein has to encounter, uh, right? And uh, it just has to navigate uh, through, um, you know, through all the crowding that exists. Um, and this obviously influences the rate at which motor proteins move, it will it'll kind of move with stops um, and things like that. But that probably does happen uh, in many of these circumstances, right? So I don't know how many of you ever traveled in trains in Bombay. I grew up in Bombay and, you know, any train you take in the morning rush hour, uh, if you want to get from one side of the train to the other side, uh, you know, you have to kind of, yeah, I don't know how you manage it, but you somehow wriggle your way through. Right. And um, um, and so that if that crowd exists um, on a regular basis, obviously your movement from one end to the other uh, is uh, affected by that crowding. And, and that's probably uh, true with motor proteins as well. Uh, there might be certain cells, there might be certain responses where the crowding is more than the others. Right. And those differences may exist, which will influence the rate at which things are moving around. But for a lot of practical purposes, um, the motor proteins and the vesicles that they carry uh, deal with the crowding and the net outcome, which means the rate at which something is being trafficked from one point to another, is effectively a combination or an uh, outcome of, uh, you know, how many motor proteins are bound, you know, which motor proteins are associated, um, and then the crowding as well. Right. So, so there will be crowding, there will be collisions, it will have to be, you know, kind of work its way around that to get from point A to point B. Right. Um, okay. Sneha has a query, how organelles hold each other? Is it by cytoplasm? Do they collide? Um, can you explain more about this? So, Sneha, your query is how do they hold each other? essentially means what is the kind of contact that happens between organelles. Um, there is another holding, which is their relative position in the cells. Um, and the relative position in the cells could be influenced by cytoskeletal components, particularly, uh, because many of these proteins do bind cytoskeletal components. Proteins, uh, sorry, many of these organelles, many of these organelles like the Golgi actually bind motor proteins, right? So the, the relative position of these organelles or these vesicular structures uh, along the cytoskeletal component can uh, be influenced by the motor proteins they carry. If you remove the motor proteins, their positions will change. Um, so that can happen for many of them. In some cases, this is well established. 
in some cases it is thought to happen but which motor protein how does this take place we don't fully know um organelles also now it is increasingly becoming uh, you know research is telling us this that there are points of contact between organelles and that there are proteins that are mediating this contact uh between the er and the mitochondria golgi and the mitochondria uh, there are direct points of contact right and um, and these are mediated by special proteins that actually localize to those sites of contact so so there could be events like that that also facilitate this what exactly that contact means an er binding to the mitochondria what does it actually do um, you know we are just uh, trying to understand this i don't think there is a lot of information that clearly says what it does right so so we um, are still in the process of asking some of these questions and we we don't know answers to how that regulation could work what we do know is those contacts now in the last 5 or 7 years do exist that there could be proteins that uh, facilitate uh, or exist at the site of that contact which means the coming together is helped by those proteins right um, and the cytoskeleton is what's keeping a lot of that relative position of organelles within the cell hmm? okay any So I have one more doubt. Sure, sure, so sure. I didn't got the difference between the lysosome and autosome. So like autosome is uh, just it digests itself, and a lysosome digests others. Is it the same? So autosome is something that uh, forms later, no? As a result of lysosome fusing something. Okay, sir. So. Hmm. You should you just look this up. Just look this up. My my understanding is that's how they are created. Lysosome is what originates from the Golgi and can go fuse with anything, right? And it can fuse with things that have to digest themselves. It can fuse with uh, you know stuff that is brought in from outside that has to be digested as well. Okay. So there is like phagosomes exist which which come from the outside and when lysosomes fuse with the phagosomes uh, you know there is something an intermediate uh, vesicle that is called the phagolysosome right and so so there are structures like this where lysosomes talk to different other vesicles or fuse with them uh, and now facilitate breakdown of whatever that it is that they are carrying hmm? Okay, okay. Um, sure Abhijit Abhishek has a query can treadmilling of cytoskeleton cause occasional puncturing of the cell membrane um okay so this is you are thinking does it actually tear the membrane am i thinking that correctly abhishek yes sir okay so uh, see the membrane is extremely flexible right and there is an excess of membrane on the plasma membrane so remember there are studies um, and thomas's lab here does these to where you know they take the cell uh, you know and attach a bead that binds to something on the surface um, and then they hold it and they pull the membrane they pull something called a membrane tether right and and what you realize is you just can keep pulling and pulling and pulling and the cell is just still okay right which means that all that excess lipid that exists is what's now going into the tether right so the lipid membrane along with the flexibility also has a significant amount of lipid in it which means any kind of so if you can pull a tether that way and not break the membrane then a simple poking of the membrane is not going to break it okay so the membrane has enough flexibility to accommodate uh, that kind of event um, you know as a matter of fact if you hold it and you keep pulling it you can pull really long tethers from the plasma membrane right and which is what really taught us that uh, there is excess amount of lipid and and you can actually do that without harming this you put this back it gets integrated back into the membrane right um so so it's a really remarkable structure and we are only beginning to understand uh, you know some of how that lipid architecture is uh, is put together and and used uh, by cells so it's unlikely that there will be a real functioning of the membrane per se hmm? okay close to the end of this session there is one query in the chat box that i'm going to take um, that has come from padma priya uh, where uh, the query is that during cell division how do lysosomes divide uh, do they need to break open um, and are they uh, you know getting divided um, 
you know, or are new lysosomes formed, formed in the Golgi before the breaking of the Golgi during cell division. So a little of both happens. I don't think lysosomes divide this way, if that's what you're thinking. Uh, whatever lysosomes are present may get distributed evenly. This again, I'm not sure there are studies to look for how the lysosomes distribute. Um, I think uh, when it comes to structures like the mitochondria, we are just beginning to understand how they are getting distributed, right? And so, uh, you know, lysosomes still uh, much remains to be understood on how the distribution happens. It's very likely that um, new lysosomes are formed uh, after the Golgi reorganizes in the two daughter cells. Um, and uh, during cell division, remember, there are many events that the cell actually pauses, right? Um, and says, okay, we are going through this, uh, you know, let's get this done and then get back to doing, uh, you know, what we were doing earlier. Um, so among the things that could pause uh, could be the making of new lysosomes, still the Golgi reassembles. And now, uh, you know, the machinery gets activated again and a lot of the trafficking uh, you know, that needs to happen, uh, including the making of uh, vesicles from the Golgi is restored, right? So that's uh, probably the best way to think about this. Hmm? Repeat myself, um, the intent here is to is for you to be able to raise any questions that you had that you wanted some clarity on. Um, and I'll see how best I can answer those. Kishan, you have a query? Go ahead, please. Sir, in the cell cycle, when we were discussing about mitochondria, mm -hmm. do you say that uh, the during mitotic exit, the mitochondria fuses? Yes. Like what happens? It, no, during so um, during mitosis, it fragments, and then during mitotic exit, uh, you know, they these fragments then again fuse together to create more elongated structures. Is it just so that it uh, distributes equally? Yes, 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 absolutely. Within the cell. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. The fragments and the movement that we talked about, right? This stirring of the proverbial cell cup, right, by the actin, um, ensures that these fragments now get distributed everywhere, um, and then the cell divides, and then they form. You know, they reassemble into the network that you know, allows them to function uh, better. So the point to remember in here in other situations is also that during cell cycle, there are certain processes, events that the cell would normally do that are paused, allowing the cell to divide um, and create this, this even distribution as well as possible. Um, and then, uh, you know, many of these functions are restored. Sir, uh, and also the slide on uh, endoplasmic reticulum, Hmm. Uh, was a little bit confusing. Like it had terms like GRASP65 uh, and many small protein names, right. which I couldn't understand. Right, right, right. So, so I, I, I'm not sure whether you mean Golgi because GRASP65 is yeah. not endoplasmic. Yes. Yeah. So, so these are structural proteins. So what I would suggest is if there is a word there that you don't know what it is, okay, um, just look this up. Right. Um, if you put GRASP5 in uh, any of the textbooks and search for it, um, you know, you will be able to find what GRASP65 is. Uh, right. But um, yes. it's, it's not important to remember GRASP65 per se. Um, it's a structural protein uh, and there are many other structural proteins that allow the Golgi to maintain its architecture. I think your understanding at this point of time, uh, we want you to get a sense of what that architecture means, the fact that that architecture is regulated, those kind of concepts are what you want to carry forward, right? You will get a chance to kind of understand a read and read more in a more detailed way um, how many of these structures are put together, assembled, what kind of proteins are there, what is the kind of regulation, all that we haven't, um, you know, we haven't brought in here because that would just complicate things at this point of time. So the, the idea or the concept is what you you want to walk away with hmm? okay Thanks, uh, thank you deep uh, your query um so as you said that these mitochondria fragment so like even Golgi and other organs also fragment right mm -hmm. just for the same reason so yeah. where is the information stored uh to you know get them back to this right so everything is um um, you know, is regulated in a, in a very, um, 
you know protein or mechanism centric manner so the, there are proteins you know which when phosphorylated will either uh, you know allow for uh, fusion of the mitochondria or fusion of the mitochondria they are not thinking at that point of time uh, this fusion fusion what the implications are right whether this is happening during cell cycle all that this protein knows is that if it is phosphorylated and i'm just giving you kind of a loose example if it is phosphorylated it has to do this which will cause fission and if it is say dephosphorylated it has to allow for uh, fusion to take place it's not of course as simple as that it's not like one protein doing just this right uh, there may be a series of proteins that need to be involved in this manner but um, when that uh, stimulus comes to them uh, you know they essentially do their job uh, the fact that that stimulus comes at the time of the cell cycle uh, is probably governed by other factors uh, in the cell uh, that are now again connected uh, to events like, um, you know, it could be anything from uh, centrosome, uh, uh, you know, division uh, to the alignment of the chromosomes. Uh, that's why cell cycle per se, the way we discussed it is extremely superficial. Right? I mean, we are just looking at the basic ideas of changes that are happening. We've not even scratched the surface of regulatory pathways that exist. Everything from what happens on the plasma membrane to the chromosomes being aligned, every little step, uh, you know, allows for, uh, you know, that pathway to talk to other pathways in the cell, which all kind of... Um, you know, network in such a way that when this particular protein that regulates mitochondrial fusion or fission or regulates Golgi organization, uh, its phosphorylation has to be controlled. It's an amalgamation of all these different networks, right? So I think at some point of time in the coming years, you are also going to look at and study about systems biology approaches, which essentially asks this kind of question. It asks if you have a protein and it's activation or phosphorylation has to be regulated in the cell. What is the kind of network that contributes to finally determining what that phosphorylation of this protein is? If you're thinking this is one pathway talking to this, it isn't, right? And, and that network is very intricate. And all these players talking to each other, regulating each other is eventually going to reflect in what the phosphorylation of this particular protein is. And that in turn, you know, is going to drive a series of events that could either cause, you know, fusion or fission as the case may be. So the same is true for the Golgi, right? GRASP-65, for example, is um, phosphorylated. Uh, GRASP uh, talks to mitochondria, sorry, God, talks to my, uh, microtubules. Microtubules have, um, you know, changes such as acetylation in microtubules that um, could differentially bind to GRASP that is phosphorylated versus not lot of such steps that uh, you know eventually determine what happens to the Golgi. As I said, it's very easy to get carried away to talk about all the little, little intricacies. Um, we've consciously tried to avoid that in this particular uh, you know, course. Uh, the idea being to introduce you to the bigger concepts of how, why is Golgi breakup important, right? You know, why uh, that architecture being taken apart and being put together is relevant? Why is that happening in so many different uh, processes uh, in the cell, right? Um, how this can be controlled. Um, and so all of these are, you know, broad concepts that you want to take away from here. But if you're interested, for example, in one particular protein, how GRASP regulates Golgi architecture, there are entire reviews that are written describing that one protein and, and its associated proteins and how they influence Golgi architecture. That is the level of detail that is available for some of these pathways and processes, right? I don't know if that answered the question, Deep. Right? It's a long winding. No, answer, sir, that, but, yeah? uh, that answered. I also have another question. Sure, sure. Like in the, in the case of plant cells, we know that after cell division occurs, Two cells are separated by the formation of that middle lamella. So, like there is the furrow formation, like in animal cells. Mm -hmm. But uh, so in bacterial cells, in the videos that I saw, uh, seen, uh, there is some sort of furrow formation. That is, they do go uh, apart from each other, and the cell membranes do collapse. But they also have a cell wall to take care of, right? Plant so, cell. how does no, a bacterial cell. Bacterial like, cell. So, okay. Yeah, so the peptid peptidoglycan cell wall does exist. Mm -hmm. So how do they 
uh, manage that. Like so, so, so I'm not sure. I'm not sure whether there is a direct mechanism that is distinctly different in the peptidoglycan layer, um, or whether once the cut happens, you know, essentially you have the peptidoglycan layer going above the cell membrane, uh, right? That allows for it to um, kind of um, seal up the bacteria, right? And and now have the cell membrane and the peptidoglycan layer running, uh, you know, all along. Sir, so, I also have a doubt. Sure. So, uh, uh, I was reading a review by the site table, uh, journal education, mm. uh, sorry, initial education. Mm. And in that, it was written endocytosis is a kind of reverse vesicle trafficking. Mm. How mm. endocytosis is a reverse vesicle trafficking? Right. So, so um, this is assuming what they mean by vesicle trafficking is a vesicle pinching off from the Golgi or a structure like that, and then making it to the plasma membrane, right? So if that is vesicular trafficking, then endocytosis is, is essentially pinching off the plasma membrane and stuff being delivered into the cell. It could go to the Golgi, it could go to other compartments as well. So I suspect that's what they are thinking of when they say it is reverse, because it's essentially a similar process, but working in opposite directions this one coming in and this one going out. They actually use uh, the cytoskeletal machinery more or less the same way. Uh, microtubules, for example, are required for delivery of vesicles in. They are required for delivery of vesicles out. Um, and a and lot of the endocytic machinery sometimes can be different, like clathrin, for example, can work at the Golgi as well as at the plasma membrane. But things like caviole happen work largely at the plasma membrane. Um, and but when caviole have to be made and delivered to the plasma membrane, they obviously pinch off from the Golgi similarly as well. So I think that's what they're referring to here. Okay, thank you, sir. Okay, so, so we know that uh, microtubules and the centrioles are uh, extremely important for uh, cell growth, cell division, and so on. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. But uh, I recently I just came across an article uh, re regarding. Uh, mutations in flies that lack the particular gene needed for centaur replication and so eventually what happens is that uh, the adult fly they don't the cells don't have any centrioles okay yet the cells are able to develop mm -hmm. i mean they do die the flies aren't that smart once they grow up but the development does happen so mm. the abstract yeah, I, I i i also don't know why that would be the case it's actually very interesting i um, i would have thought that uh, do they provide an explanation for why? Uh, no, I wasn't able to find an explanation. Okay, please. Is there something else that takes over the role of the um, centrosome? Um, I'm not sure whether there are studies that have been done in mammalian systems that uh, look at this very similarly. So, for example, the Golgi in flies is very differently organized as compared to uh, the Golgi in mammalian cells. So, I was I mean, tempted to say uh, that the Golgi could um, come in and do what the centrosome does, but I also know that the Golgi uh, is organized very differently there. So does that act as a nucleating center like centrosome does here in mammalian cells? Does that do a similar role in flies? I actually oh, do not know. Because uh, eventually the uh, end result what happens is that uh, the cells do not have any cilia, flagella and so on. Mm -hmm. does it, is this targeted in one specific cell? No, it doesn't seem like it. Okay, okay. We okay. might just read the abstract and part of the results, but okay. it doesn't seem like it. Look this up and, and if required, speak to Girish. I, I also, I mean, I, I will have to go read enough to know how this is happening. Uh, it's an interesting result if that is the case. And they must have an uh, at least a suggestion on what could be happening as to why the cells are able to, uh, you know, live through this, right? Um, and what exactly compensates for what the role of the centrosome? Because obviously there is a role for the centrosome and something has to compensate for it. Um, and I don't know whether in flies there is a system that allows for that. My doubt is like it isn't uh, exactly related to the course material. Okay. But in all the animations and the videos we saw, hmm. how exactly are the simulations being done? Because yeah, 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 I would yeah. guess that these are all like so biophysics would be based mm -hmm. on statistical mm -hmm. mechanics. But how yeah. are they uh, so sure of uh, like all the dynamics. Yeah. So, so uh, my short answer here would be that uh, this is this will be evolving. Uh, this is based on current information that we have. 
Many of these is coming in small parts and pieces from different studies, which um, you know are looking at very specific aspects. Obviously, there isn't one study that looks at all of this. Everything from the size of a vesicle to say how many motor proteins bind um, cannot come from one particular study. Uh, so the the hope, um, I mean, the intent here was to kind of assimilate the current information and see if that can be used to generate a model that looks like the best model right now, right? So it isn't the perfect one. It may not also be how, uh, you know, entirely accurate. Uh, you know, we may revise this. Um, and I think that is one of the... Um, uh, important requirements, I think, in, in any scientific inquiry that I think you have to be open to this kind of revision. Um, and the hope is, uh, you know, five years from now, there will be an updated version and a bunch of things will be different. You know, five years from then, uh, there will be another updated version and we will add new things to it. Right. Um, and as I said, something as simple as how the mitochondria are distributed inside the cells right, during cell division. We, we just discovered it four months ago, right? Uh, and, and we've been looking at cells forever, you know, at least for a few 50, 60 years with some level of, um, uh, you know, some level of intent. So, yeah, so there isn't, uh, it. it's the best that we have based on information that is available right now. And this will obviously keep evolving. Um, I think some of that information is also coming from different, cell types so that's another point to consider right uh, that um, uh, we don't think i don't think we have uh, all information from one type of cells so uh, so you're putting all of this together and trying to see if you can generate a model that reflects what's going on uh, i think a lot of systems biology is essentially trying to do this uh, in in more than one ways is to essentially tie information together um, that's coming from very diverse sources in a way that allows us to see a big picture, uh, you know, which is closer to the real thing. I, I think it will be a while before we can say this is the real thing. Yeah, and uh, I, I uh, read about this a while back or that uh, proving, the, proving mathematically that uh, the DNA uh, is uh coiled and packaged to fit within the uh nucleus is an unsolved problem mm -hmm. so uh, uh how how would how would uh like how would you test the validity of a uh, of uh, dna coiling models if we don't uh, know I, I, I am the wrong person to answer this right <laughs> so no i i i my my short answer will be i really don't know i think you have to ask people who uh, you know who study this uh, to kind of figure out what the understanding of the field is in terms of uh, you know how that architecture looks and how it is put together sneha you had a query oh uh, yes so in bidirectionality the uh, the yeah. motor proteins yeah motor proteins okay. so in bidirectionality they move in both direction so if it get cut at a at a point so will it will it change its form no i'm it not really... sure i understood the question in bidirectionality what gets cut no sir in bidirectionality if the if the protein get cuts at a particular time then will it uh, will it uh, Will it keep its state? Like, will it be? Uh, will it go in so bad direction, or will it more, from more, the motor, motor protein uh, gets cut? You're saying? Yes. What do you mean by cut? It it break if it breaks in between. Like the motor protein snaps in between. Yes. And it's a bidirectional motor protein goes in both directions. Yes, sir. And your query is, will it stay bidirectional? Yes. It depends on where it breaks, no? So if it breaks in the middle? Middle means like this. Like there are two, two arms to walking of the motor protein, right? If the door, both arms don't are not attached to the same structure, it won't walk. Yes, sir. Right. Right. So, so I, it's, uh, I mean, uh, I understand your question, but maybe you're not framing it correctly. 
because uh, a protein breaking is is a very loose term right i mean if you are saying that it loses one of its legs will it continue to walk uh, you know chances are it won't uh, right um, if a um, protein breaks along its shaft such that the vesicle falls off the base of the protein which is actually of the motor protein that's walking will continue to right it may not be able to bind something but it will probably walk okay sir sure. right uh vignesh in chat has a query saying aren't these animations more of a movie than true scientific stimulation uh simulation i think uh, with something like the inner life of the cell um there is a fair amount of accuracy to what they have built um and uh, those are fairly uh, accurate right um but there are other movies which are largely meant to explain how a phenomena looks uh, which are more a schematic or a cartoon rather than um true scientific uh, simulation but inner life of the cell was built with the understanding that it's going to be uh, you know it's built with a lot of uh, information that has come from scientific uh, work uh, and so is meant to be fairly accurate for that particular time of course uh, i have a question yeah yeah go ahead yeah uh, i remember uh, that this was a while back i remember talking to someone who was working on using uh, quantum computing techniques in like uh, microscopy of cells like uh, how can you image uh, living cells using uh, uh, quantum mechanics so there they used uh, like uh, you use the fact that these energy gaps are quantized to uh, so, uh, use light that doesn't disturb the cell but like uh, similar to how there is uh, for uh, even if you consider classical optics there's a limit to the resolution which you can get right mm -hmm. so is there some uh, fundamental like limit in uh, microscopy of biology just due to the yeah, right. yeah right right now there is no uh, in terms of uh, for the same reasons that you're pointing out um, i think um, you know see electron microscopy is probably what gives you um the kind of resolution in terms of cells that's the best we have at this point of time um now the challenge with electron microscopy obviously is that um, you know we've not really been able to look at um live cells uh, at least not yet um and uh, there isn't a method that allows us to um, uh, you know to do that uh, being able to look at just cross sectional images uh, in em and put a, a 3d reconstituted image uh, has probably happened in the last 10 15 years and and you know that's obviously added a lot yeah so so there is a limit to what we can use um, you know some of that limit is being stretched by the fact that you are uh, you know using algorithms that um, that uh, fill information uh, in ways that is very intuitive um, and uh, it doesn't exist actually in the image right so you can clean up the image uh, in a way that um, allows you to see something that actually is not there in the parent image um, and and that has improved resolution a bit but that's yeah that's cheating right uh, i mean uh, in effect uh, it's um, not really uh, the actual yeah, but important. the way that you're being processed by the, by the way it is being processed so um, yeah so there is a limitation there right and 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 there might be things that will come up in the future that allow us to achieve a greater resolution uh, without actually damaging the cell in such a way that um, we are able to yeah that we are able to see um, you know things with uh, greater greater clarity uh, right now what we are doing is we are combining the kind of image and information uh, that still images produced in em uh, with the kind of dynamics that we can achieve in live cells um, and trying to assimilate the two to kind of make sense of how this is all possibly working um, to get that kind of resolution in this kind of a setting will be will be quite something yeah and it will it will ask allow us to ask things that we've not been able to ask so far yeah yeah still still a lot remains to be done <laughs>